It's an enormous pleasure to introduce Professor Boaventura de Souza Santos, who is Professor of Sociology at the University of Coimbra in Portugal and Distinguished Legal Scholar at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. More importantly, Professor de Souza Santos is a leading figure in scholarship around what it means to decolonize education and to decolonize the university. So it's a particular pleasure to ask Professor de Souza Santos to reflect on the role of the university in the colonial project and what it means to decolonize the university. You're most welcome, Professor de Souza Santos. A great pleasure to be with, with you Thank here, you. Leon. I wonder if we could start off by you just telling us a little bit about how you understand the historical role of the university in relation to colonialism and the colonial project. Okay, Leon, uh, I think that uh, um, as far as this question is concerned, uh, I think it would be advisable to make a kind of precision. What do we mean by colonialism? I think that uh, as the, the question is phrased, uh, formulated, uh, you are thinking about historical, what I call uh, historical colonialism. That is to say, the historical form of colonialism, which is basically a, a kind of a, uh, a territory, uh, foreign occupation of uh, uh, a foreign territory. Um, this has been historical uh, colonialism all along. But from my point of view and from the point of view of post-colonial studies in general, uh, colonialism uh, didn't end uh, with the end uh, of uh, historical colonialism with independence. It continues uh, under different forms. And uh, we live today in colonialist societies. Uh, historical colonialism is over, but there is colonialism. Is colonialism in the form of racism is colonialism in the form of the concentration of land grabbing, for instance, of uh, the expulsion of peasants and, uh, and indigenous peoples, um, in extractivism of natural resources, in fact, uh, a great continuity with the extraction, the colonial extraction, and what we would call the primitive accumulation. That is to say, we live, in fact, uh, in societies that are capitalist, colonialist, and patriarchal. So I think it is um, uh, important to make this precision so that we know what we are talking about. And so I'm going to limit myself now to the uh, to the historical colonialism and then to colonialism. You know? I think that as far as the, this question is concerned, we can distinguish some uh, direct uh, role and the indirect role. Well, the direct role is that the, many of the universities from the 16th century onward, the European universities, were in fact protagonists in uh, the colonial expansion. In fact, they were the, the locations, the institutions where the, administrator, the administrators and missionaries were trained for the colonies. Uh, in most cases, uh, these universities were really subsidiaries of the metropolitan universities in Europe. And then they were transplanted, in a sense, to, to, to the colonies. Uh, the first ones were probably the the Spanish uh, universities. The model was the the very old University of Salamanca, and uh, the Spaniards from the 1536 onwards, uh, they are going to uh, create uh, some uh, between that date that date and uh, early 19th century. They were going to create more than 35 uh, universities in the colonies in in the Americas. The first one was in Peru, then Mexico, in Colombia, Santo Domingo, etc. Uh, so these colonies basically were uh, there were a double authorization in the for these for these universities. Uh, they were uh, a papal uh, uh, authorization. The Pope had to give an authorization, and then. The, what they what it was called the royal privilege. Um, so these uh, universities were really, uh, you know, stopped by 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 uh, colonizers, by people coming from Europe, 
and uh, their mission was to train missionaries and administrators. And um, and that was the case in Spain. Late later on, the, the you know one well, actually well, less than a century or around a century later, uh, the, the the British are going to do the same in the United States. What is now the, the United States? It starts in 1636, and in fact, the the colleges that are going to be uh, instituted or created in the colonies are going to be called colonial colleges. In fact, uh, of the nine colonial colleges that were created, seven are the current Ivy League universities. The first one was uh, uh, Harvard, and then Yale, and then Princeton, and then Columbia, and then Penn. They used to say there were all kinds of universities, and they were really colonial, col with the same purpose, basically. In the case of the, in, in the case of, uh, of the, the uh, Britain as well, in in India, for instance, uh, the, uh, the British uh, created 21 in the Indian subcontinent, uh, 21 universities, and after partition, 19 in India and two in Pakistan. So, and then in, in Africa, several universities throughout Africa, Ghana was probably the best known case, but in Sudan and Zimbabwe, and uh, you know, Wits, for instance, in South Africa was created in, uh, in uh, 1896. The Portuguese is a very interesting case because it offers a, st a star contracts with this, because the Portuguese never created any university in the colonies. In fact, all the, 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 the people, the students, would uh, come from my university. And if they were people that were, uh, uh, born, uh, were born in the colonies, they would uh, come to Coimbra, my university, which was founded in 1290, to be trained. And in fact, uh, only in uh, uh, 1960, in fact, uh, the Portuguese created a university in Mozambique and then also in Angola. So it was a different colonial strategy. But, you know, uh, of course, these, these universities were not concerned with indigenous people or with the native uh, populations. They were really concerned with uh, the colonial enterprise and, of course, the knowledge that they were uh, uh, teaching there and studying there was the Eurocentric uh, uh, knowledge, was what I have been calling in the epistemology of the South, the knowledge of the winners. I mean, that's basically the knowledge, the Eurocentric uh, knowledge, right? Then we can see, this is the probably the, the most direct, the university in the colonies, but then the metropolitan universities and all kinds of links and ties with the colonial enterprise at different, very different levels. As I said, for this, the Portuguese university was the one in which they were training all the staff and uh, all the administrations and, uh, and missionaries. But then it was the kind of knowledge. I mean, the metropolitan universities in, in the case of the, the European metropolis, they really uh, were absolutely and exclusively concentrated on the, what I call the knowledge of the winners, the Eurocentric knowledge or the epistemology of the North, if you like. And this knowledge was based on five main monocultures, that is to say, exclusive conceptions of the world that were taught at the university. No other was taught at the time. That's why they are monoculture. The first monoculture was the monoculture of knowledge. That is to say, only science at the beginning, also theology and philosophy, uh, the three of them, uh, Western-centric, were taught at the university. No other knowledge was taught at, that, at the university. And therefore, uh, indigenous philosophies, uh, Indian philosophies, African philosophies, or knowledge as ways of knowing, nothing of that was uh, uh, considered. Uh, second of all, the, mono, the, the monoculture of uh, differences, of the naturalization of differences. That is to say, all these dichotomies upon which uh, uh, Western-centric knowledge is based was really elaborated upon in the universities in the metropolitan uh, uh, regions of the world. That is to say, the, the dichotomy between humanity and nature, the Cartesian conceptions of nature was absolutely uh, a monopoly of the conceptions on our relationships. 
then the the dichotomy of the 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 white and black the, the inferior dichotomies of races and of course the inferiority of all the other races other than the 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 white race so the naturalization of differences uh sexism patriarchy man and woman i mean all of that was basically part of this monoculture the third monoculture was the monoculture of linear time that is to say of the reversible and uh, uh, unified uh, arrow of time uh, from uh, uh, underdeveloped to developed from uh, uh, savage to civilization uh, from underdevelopment to development and of course the european countries were on the front line on any of these uh, conceptions the progressive the developed the civilized and all the others were really uh, um, savage underdeveloped uh, and of course uh, uh, retrogressive so that was uh, a third monopoly which was very detrimental to any other culture with which the universities were concerned particularly in the colonies the fourth one was the the monopoly of scale the idea of the universal the universal as uh, uh, any entity that can be understood uh, independently of its context so the general idea uh, the universal idea the idea of god uh, all the ideas of philosophy were universal to the extent they uh, they are valid independent of their context uh, the context and of course this was also very important and therefore everything that didn't coincide with these ideas were particular were local and therefore were diminished and uh, they didn't deserve the privilege of being studied at the university and um, there was also a, a, a final uh, a monopoly which was the the monopoly of productivity only uh, the, the the economy in the metropolitan Europe was productive, was capitalist production, commercial capitalism, then industrial capitalism, and all the other forms of production, peasant economy, indigenous economies, uh, family or cooperative forms, communal property, everything was consider, considered as uh, non-productive. And of course, the people, that were concentrated on those forms of uh, economies were lazy were uh, uh, lascivious <laughs> and were uh, uh, of course ignorant and uh, unproductive so i think that was the first connection of the the, the universities with the, the national project but there was many others i'll identify uh, uh, some others which i think are of interest for our uh, for our conversation here the second one the first one were the, monoc the, the monocultures uh, and the refusal of, on any ecology. And the second one was the national project, the idea that uh, the countries, uh, the European countries, I mean, uh, were nation states. And this starts in from 17th century. And the idea of nationality, of nation state, the coincidence of the nation with the state, was quite foreign in the 17th or the 18th century in many regions of Europe, even the 19th century. So it was this idea that there, there is a coherence in this geopolitical space, which was the new state after 1648. They were nations also. So the idea of the more homogeneity. And in a sense, we are going to have colonialism inside Europe. Is not just uh, from Britain vis-a-vis -vis Ireland, for instance, is also the, the Catholic kings vis-a-vis uh, -vis Andalusian and uh, the Andalus, which was for a while occupied for a while, for several centuries, uh, uh, the territory of the Muslims of the, the uh, El Andalus, the Arab uh, occupation of the peninsula. So all this uh, uh, shows that uh, the idea of the national project was the idea of creating a kind of a unit uh, the unit uh, meant basically that there was a, a culture, the British cultures, Portuguese culture, Spanish culture, and French culture, which of course was a violence vis-a-vis uh, -vis all the diversity of cultures existing in these regions, and uh, a single law, the law of the state, as the only one in a society in which there was a plurality of legal systems, and a system of education, a system of armed forces, and so on. 
it's very important here in this to consider this national project because this national project is 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 uh, um, constituted by what I call in the epistemology of the South the Abyssa line. That is to say, is the the project that divides the world in two separate forms or zones, zones of society and zones of sociability, forms of sociability. The metropolitan one uh, in which uh, we consider uh, to be inhabited by the, the fully human beings, uh, which are the us, the people that belong to our society in Europe, so to say, and then the colonial, Society or sociability that could exist also in uh, in uh, in Europe because there were slaves, for instance, and black people. Twenty five percent of the population in Lisbon in the eighteenth century was black, uh, free, and slaves, uh, free black people and and slaves. So the idea of the of the abyssaline: some people are treated as fully human, other people are treated as subhuman. Uh, they are racialized and sexualized bodies. And this is one of the forms that is very current in our time, one forms of colonialism. So this was built from then on uh, under the, the colonial project of the universities. A third aspect of the, of the, the links between the universities and the colonialism is the fact that they were, the European uh, universities were funded by the revenues coming from colonialism slave trade, for instance, and for more all the exploitation of the resources in, in the colonies. Uh, and that's why we have the, the, the names of our, of our buildings and you, we have also the statues and so on. And so this was a, a colonial enterprise and to a, a great extent, also in terms of the, the funding of it. And then there was sometimes even more uh, explicit uh, forms of uh, uh, university colonialism. Uh, um, for instance, uh, up until very recently in, in Africa, uh, in South Africa with the, the university apartheid, so the black universities and white universities. And in the United States, we had some uh, similar situation, not as strict, of course, as the, the the South African, but in any case, uh, uh, the universities that were uh, basically for black people in the early 20s in the, of, of the, the past century. So we have all these links of the university with the colonial enterprise. And, and I think that uh, is a, a very broad field of uh, uh, com not just complicities, but uh, protagonism of the universities in uh, in the colonial enterprise. So that would be the answer to your first question. Thank you very much. Um, I wonder if you could uh, reflect on what you consider to be the key historical moments that have led to current demands to decolonize the university. Yeah, uh, the, the historical uh, uh, moments uh, are you distinguish uh, two or three. <clears throat> the first one, historically speaking, is um, after the, basically after the independence, for instance, in the Americas, uh, you see that the Creole elites, that is to say the descendants of the uh, colonizers that were already born in the colonies, both in the North America and uh, in South America, they, claim that the universities as they st uh, stood in their uh, curriculum, their ideas, didn't fit the needs of the emerging uh, bourgeoisie, of the emerging elites. Uh, it was very clear in, uh, in South America, also in the United States even earlier. And uh, therefore there was a demand uh, to give more autonomy to the university vis-a-vis -vis the European heritage. Uh, probably the most famous movement of this phase is the, 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 the revolt of the students in 1917 in Cordoba, Argentina. Uh, it was a very famous mo movement that led to, was 1917-1918, that led to the A Manifesto, that became a kind of a revolution, in a sense, of the, uh, of the universities in all the continent, all the continent. 
what was basically the idea is that the university in Cordoba was still run by religious people, by the church. And it was, uh, it, they were teaching precisely the same thing that Salamanca in Spain had been teaching for centuries. So it was not relevant to realities of uh, uh, an emerging new country, Argentina. So the idea is that change the curriculum, the topics, what kind of topics they wanted. <clears throat> they wanted the aggiornament, that is to say the updating with the knowledge, the European knowledge that was being taught in Europe. So it was a, 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 a kind of a very weak decolonization because it was really a quest for colonial knowledge uh, as it was taught in the European universities and basically for the people of the middle classes, the emerging middle classes that were the descendants of the elites. But this manifest was very important for another reason is that the students were also very much aware that universities should have social responsibility vis-a-vis -vis the society and vis-a-vis -vis the people that had no access to the university. Uh, they didn't uh, uh, ask for any radical change in this, but they um, uh, request that the university create departments that are uh, dedicated to develop the links and the interaction and the solidarity of the university with the society at large and they were called extension departments. So the extension departments started from there in the Americas and became a very important uh, element uh, in, the, in the university. So I think that uh, there was no question of diversifying the, the students or, or the staff at this point. So this is the first uh, moment, historical moment. The second demand uh, comes with demands of the students much later uh, and, and these demands are uh, sometimes a part of broader uh, 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 movements in society. For instance, the, uh, the civil rights movement in the United States brought with it the idea of the affirmative actions that would allow the students, black students, and indigenous students, to uh, enter the university, to, to access to the university. So it was a change in uh, the student body. And uh, this uh, uh, came later in many other countries, for instance, in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in India, for instance, much later uh, in the Nehru University, basically in the other universities, uh, not only students from different castes, uh, some kind of affirmative action vis-a-vis uh, -vis different castes and of course uh, a neutrality vis-a-vis -vis the Indian uh, uh, Hindu religion and Muslim religion. Something that, as you know, has been questioned, uh, has been uh, questioned these days by uh, the conservative government of Narendra mm -hmm. Modi. So that, that was the idea that we should change uh, basically the, the student body. And uh, there was uh, no uh, changes in the curriculum uh, or in the, the, the staff, the faculty. I think the third moment uh, arrives in, uh, you know, in the last 20 years, probably less, and uh, very remarkably so in South Africa, where the, the, the roads must fall movement, and then the, the, also the fees must fall, and, and all of them together. It is a new demand which comes closer then to other movements that we are going to uh, to encounter in Europe, uh, first of all in, in, in the United Kingdom, but also in other countries in Europe, uh, is that um, the demand is, is much broader because it's not just uh, uh, for the diversification of the student body, is all to diversify also the faculty, for instance, in Brazil, in many other countries, that we should have more indigenous uh, professors and black professors, African descent professors, and so on and so forth. But then the curriculum, that is to say the types of knowledges that are taught at university. So the third moment is basically the moment in which uh, we have been in the last decades, is the moment in which the knowledge of the winners gets confronted by uh, all these uh, struggles uh, and the protests of the students. And the idea basically then you can see uh, in the following uh, um, as it consists um, of uh, 
different issues that we can then specify. But in any case, it's deeper. It's deeper because it goes to the, the core of the university task and mission, which is the knowledge that it creates and uh, disseminates. And uh, this is the third moment in which uh, we are. But usually, uh, any of the, the uh, uh, moments carries with it the previous moment. That is to say, the previous demands are still in many countries to be met. So you have this, now they are moments, at the same time they are layers of demands. Some they are at the, the basic level, the first level, then second level, then third level. And the contexts vary, you know, vary dramatically from country to country, from region to region. But these are the, the, the three main historical moments. Thank you very much indeed for that comprehensive answer. My, my, my next question is really um, to, to ask you what you understand by this term decolonizing the university. What does it mean to you? Well, on, I, I, uh, it's also a very good question. And um, I think that uh, uh, in answering it, I'll try to answer also what uh, does it not mean to decolonize? Because I think the two are, uh, in a sense, uh, uh, in the mirror of each other, so to say, right? We can see them in the mirror. Basically, what do I mean by decolonizing? Well, we have to start from the, 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 the assumption that we don't live just in colonial societies. We live in capitalist and patriarchal societies. So, so uh, when we talk about decolonizing, uh, from my point of view, I know that in the, the colonial studies very often, there is uh, the idea that uh, uh, colonialism is the matrix of the contemporary societies. I don't think so. Uh, I think that colonialism is one of the three metrics of, of contemporary society. The other two being capitalism and patriarchy. And therefore, does it make any sense from my point of view to tackle one, to confront one without confronting the other two? That is to say, we decolonize to the extent that we decommodify the university and to the extent that we depatriarchalize the university. So decolonizing the university uh, or society in general is a very broad process in which these three uh, types of struggle should be articulated because uh, 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 decolonizing separated from anti-capitalism or anti-patriarchalism is a uh, very weak type of struggle in my view, right? So the first one is that we, uh, we should try to have this uh, uh, broad sense in which uh, colonialism is integrated. And this makes things uh, more complicated because of course there are many struggles <clears throat> that seem to be on, on, on the surface, have a, a kind of a decolonial vocation, but in fact, they are promoting capitalism. Uh, we must have, for instance, we have some forms of radicalism these days that uh, are uh, uh, even religious radicalism that is very much immersed in the, the ugliest forms of financial capitalism. So I don't consider decolonizing uh, that is uh, comfortable with capitalist domination and patriarchal domination. So this is the first precision that I'd like to, to make. The second one is that it is not decolonizing to reverse colonialism, to replace one colonialism by the other. That is to say, if uh, now we have epistemology of the North, we are going to have epistemology of the South, and the epistemology of the South is just uh, the knowledge produced in the colonies or colonized the, the people. Now, I think that I have been making very clear in the epistemology of the South, the epistemology of the South is the effort to validate the knowledge is born in struggle by the people that they've been fighting and struggling against capitalism, colonialism, and patriarchy. And of course, sometimes they resort to science 
And sometimes they resort to other kinds of knowledge, popular knowledges, vernacular knowledges, indigenous knowledges, peasant knowledges. That is to say, the idea that uh, it's clear for the epistemology of the South is that science is a valid way of knowing, but is not the only valid way of knowing. There are other ways of knowing. And uh, even science as a valid way of knowing should be scrutinized to see what is its role in the struggles against capitalism, capitalism and patriarchy. Actually, I learned that not from uh, theoreticians, but from Amilcar Cabral, who was a great uh, leader of the liberation movement against Portuguese colonialism. He himself was an agronomer, an engineer, and uh, he said, no, I mean, there are aspects of the knowledge produced by the colonizers that may be very useful to our struggles. So we have to uh, not to discard these, uh, these science. So there is no relativism here. That is to say that everything goes or all kinds of knowledge are equally valid. Now, they are valid for different purposes. And that's why science has to be also submitted to this second criteria, which is that which kind of science for which kind of purposes. So the basically, and of course, indigenous knowledge uh, cannot be a good kind of knowledge to take me to the moon. Uh, it's a different object. Probably it is very good, uh, for ecological struggles, because it brings me in harmony, uh, into harmony with Mother Earth, with nature, which probably Western-centric knowledge will never do that in science, much less. So I think that what we need is the plea for the, the ecology of knowledge, and therefore decolonizing is that this very broad. And being very broad means basically that all those demands that we have analyzed before has to be considered. That is to say, uh, we have to consider not only to diversify our student body because uh, uh, of capitalist constraints, our universities are inaccessible in most countries in the world to the majority of the young people of those countries. We have to mo uh, diversify also uh, uh, the faculty because sometimes we train our students uh, from different backgrounds, ethno-racial backgrounds and religious backgrounds, but then they are discriminated against in their career. Women have been discriminated against all along and only now we are facing this uh, discrimination. Then, of course, the curriculum, the curriculum and the pedagogy have to change because we cannot teach the same type, different types of knowledge to the, the, the same pedagogies. For instance, most of the non-Western-centric uh, knowledge is oral knowledge. So we have to have other forms of teaching, of learning, uh, the circles of conversation, the other forms the, of more collaborative, more horizontal forms of co-learning, what Paulo Freire called the, peda peda uh, the pedagogy of liberation, the pedagogy of the oppressed. So there are different methodologies, different pedagogies, of course, that have to be brought in. For instance, in uh, my book, the, the End of the Cognitive Empire, it, the book is divided in three parts, the epistemology, the methodology, and the pedagogy. I see them uh, interlinked, deeply interlinked and in, intertwined. So I think that we have to consider the, uh, the decolonizing in this respect. More precisely than very, very uh, 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 rapidly, I think that decolonizing means basically, in terms of knowledge, uh, means basically to move from the mon monocultures to the ecologies. So if there are five monocultures, we should struggle in our education, for instance, in our training, in our uh, uh, research, move from the, the monopolies, from the monocultures to the ecology. The first one would be from the monoculture of knowledge to the ecologies of knowledge, from the monoculture of the classification to an ecology of differences without hierarchies, from the monoculture of the linear time to the ecology of temporalities and durations of other conceptions of time that really exist in our time. They don't have to be invented. Exceptional is the linear time. From the monoculture of the scale Oh, universal to global as the main scales to an ecology of scales in which we aim at that what I call transcalality. That is to say, local, 
national and global interlinked. So this uh, transscaling is uh, a form of ecology. And of course, ecologies of uh, productivities. But of course, there is individual property and capitalist economy. For a long time, probably we're not going to be get rid of the capitalist economy. But we know that there are other economies. 70% of our food comes from family agriculture. And family agriculture is not run by the, the capitalist the criteria that are typical of the agro industry, for instance, or the meat processing plants. It's not the same thing. So I think that we should also have a, a, an ecology here. So I think that uh, we uh, basically, in a, in a, a nutshell, uh, decolonizing is to move from abyssal thinking, that is to say the, the thinking that uh, establishes an abyssal line between the full human beings and the subhuman beings to the post-abyssal knowledge, that is to say a knowledge that is aimed at superseding, overcoming uh, the abyssal line. And therefore my concept of decolonizing would be this one. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, Professor.